I'm not going to do two things at once. Okay. Am I recording? I'm recording. Okay. So we're here today to look um, to look at the report for the panel cleanup work in IntraHealth profile. And um, most of you hopefully were actually on a call about three weeks ago when we did the initial um, the initial report. And and um, since then we've had um, quite a bit of feedback just on some refinements that we need needed to make. So those have been done. And I just wanted to um, say a special thank you to a few of you on the phone, Tamara, um, Candice, I don't see um, Adam or Joe, but they we had a few of you that um, helped just working with Andy and I to make those refinements. Um, thanks very much for your time and input. So this is very much a, a work in progress and I, I hope I've been able to convey in previous meetings that, I mean, this work for us as a program is also new and these reports are designed to uncover, um, uncover things, uncover misinformation, which opens up a whole other can of worms. And so it's gonna be a little bit messy and what we need to do collectively, um, all of us, is to figure out ways that we can start to kind of um, identify some of that low-hanging fruit and some of the common things that we could be looking at to help improve the actual cleanup work for the practices. So please take, take that into context for what we're gonna look at today, which is a report that is designed to help us look at some specific metrics around um, demographics and so forth in the EMR, and then acknowledging that there's going to be, you know, work to do to help the practice um, sort of do that cleanup work. So um, I envision that for sort of the course of the pilot, we need to all stay well connected and figure out what's working um, well for you guys as you're out there um, trying it in practices, what points of confusion, um, how can we help improve the process before we would think about making this um, more of a, a broader um, provincial offering. So with that said, um, we've got Andy here from InterHealth today. Thanks Andy um, for being here and he's done um, a lot of work with us to help make this report as useful as it can be. Um, and we're gonna go through it again today just from sort of start to finish and we'll um, try to highlight where we've made um, changes to um, uh, some of the um, parameters or um, numerators or denominators around the report so that you can understand clearly how it's working. Um, also wanted to mention that we're just in the final um, stages of, um, of uh, the refined user guide. So that is a supplementary docu document that we'll send out as well. So you guys will be able to have that in your back pocket before you're heading to a practice um, as well as the physicians will have that. So stay tuned for that. I am recording, so um, you will be able to uh, go back and refer to our meeting today um, if you need um, a refresher, or as always, I'm available for questions and is Andy um, if you need anything. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over. Andy's already got um, his screen showing, which is great. We'll start, we've got an hour and a half. We might not need all that time, so if we can, we'll end early. Over to you, Andy. Okay, uh, before I begin, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephanie Howard. She's sitting in on this um, meeting right now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Derek Yang as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, right. thanks, sorry. I forgot to introduce you, Stephanie. I'm sorry. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> Derek's also here. He's the, the other part of my team in case um, we, uh, we like to cross train everyone in our, in our team to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. Great, hi Derek. Our coffee. Okay, um, so we're gonna look into three different areas of profile to access these reports. Uh, the first area we're gonna navigate to is the stored report. And how we get there is under report, you'll see stored reports right here. And in your stored reports, you should find one actual report which is labeled as the age distribution by gender. Uh, by double clicking on it, it gives you an output of your age groups along with your male and female patients along with the total and if there's any um, of the patients that have been identified as unknown or transgender or et cetera will be uh, displayed under this column. Uh, please do note that there will be a discrepancy because some 
like because if the clinic was imported from another uh, program, um, it may not be calculated under these totals, so there is a discrepancy in the total numbers. Does anyone have any questions regarding this report? Yes, I do. It's Jennifer. Um, is this how do you? Is this just for which physician? Like, how do you? Can you? Like, if you were only wanting to do one physician, like I didn't see an option to choose. Uh, this was uh, built as a macro. Um, it was specified just to build to build it underneath the whole clinic and not just one specific provider. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to close this off and we're just going to navigate to the next area under report and stored queries. We'll find a query that's labeled as patient demographics missed. Basically, what this report pulls is any of your patients that don't have an address, a postal code, a phone number, a status, or an usual provider. And what I'll do is I'll just open up the parameters so you can see what it looks like. So with this query, um, originally we just had it so it just was looking for the street, the postal code, and the phone number, but we did some revisions on it and added a status and a usual doctor. So if any of these fields are null, which means like they don't have anything inside of it, it will pull that data and give you the output for it. So what I'll do is I'll just run the report. And it should give you an output of all the data. So you'll notice that there's some fields that are missing and all the patients will be displayed under here. Does anyone have any questions about this report? I think we're good, Andy. Thanks. Okay. okay, and the last area we're going to navigate to is uh, the groups module. So if we click on the work center, and select the clinical button right here, we'll find groups. Um, so what I've done is I created an EMR panel folder which has all the dynamic groups built in. Um, please be advised that every single group that you find in this uh, module, it, there's a macro behind it. Um, it runs a very data intensive search through the database. Um, the minimum time I've seen it run for is like at least four minutes. Uh, what we'll do is we'll run through maybe one or two and I'll show you exactly what the macro string is and explain things. And then after that, we'll go into um, how to filter out just for a specific provider. Um, so starting off with the diabetic group, or all these groups right here, they look for any diagnostic code that starts with X. So what I'll do is I'll bring up a screenshot of the filtering of the macro. Um, so where I've highlighted in red, this will explain to you what's going on in the macro itself. And this is applied to all of these groups right here. So there are some pretty data intensive searches in here, such as looking for patients with uh, five or more medications or 10 or more. Um, here, this is just the generic one where it's looking for, you're looking for a specific diagnostic code and it starts with. Uh, this portion right here is looking for that diagnostic code in the patient's problem list. And this portion right here is looking for active patients only. 
So going back into profile, and if I just open up the diabetes group, you can see in here that I'm just looking for starts with 250. So if you have a patient that's coded with 250.1, 250.2, Etc. It will actually pull into this group right here. What we'll do is we'll quickly hit the process button just to mine the data, and you'll be prompted with this uh, little window right here telling you how many seconds is left as it's searching. Thanks, Andy. This might be a good time just to remind the group. So, um, Andy has pointed out um, to us a few times that so depending on um, the size of the of the practices database, you know, it will vary on the amount of time it takes to to run these queries. So just to be mindful that um, it's it's not advised to be trying to to do this pull these reports with um, a physician during um, like hours where they would be they or colleagues would be seeing patients. So either early morning or or after patients um, have been seen, just because we can't really guarantee. But as you can see on average, you know, it can take um, 20 to 40 seconds to run each of these. So it's a little bit of time, and certainly um, it will, that time will increase um, during active hours of the, of the clinic. Is that correct, Andy? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, uh, so if you guys look at the bottom right here, uh, this is your outcome. So it has, it will list all your patients that have the code 250 or 250.1, et cetera. Uh, other functionality that groups can do is if you wanted to, let's say, add a problem or add like an alert to all the patients that have been pulled with diabetes, you guys can use the undock portion right here. which then allows you to like check all your patients and if you want to add a recall for them, you can do that, add them to a care plan, add a specific problem, or anything through the drop down, you can do that. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll just open up a patient's clinical details just to show you guys that uh, diabetes is located in their, their problem list. So we'll just select someone at random. Andy, can you add an alert from that section too? I noticed the option there to select it, but. Where does that alert show up? Uh, this needs to be set up underneath uh, your short codes. Uh, I believe this is more for public health authorities. You wanted like a generic pop up to come up, like yeah, when, yeah. I just or or if it if it pops up somewhere like where when does it pop up and when the patient's chart is accessed? You'll need to do it as a problem or a social risk or administrative, and then right here under alerts you can check off where you want the alert when it'll pop up. That's the best way to handle oh. it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's good. Thank you. Okay, um, the next, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because it does take a long time to pull out uh, the macros and just mine the data. Uh, what we'll move on to next is like patients on five or more medications. Um, we did a revision to this one. I'll bring up a screenshot. Okay. So before, prior to the revision, uh, what it, what this macro looked for was in the patient's medications list, it would just look for anything that is still active, so anything that hasn't been flagged. Um, after our couple of meetings, we decided to just look under the patient's usual medications, which would make more sense. And we've also added a line where it's looking for active patients only, as to the previous version, it would only look for, uh, it would also look for inactive patients. Um, so what we'll do is we'll quickly run this group and I'll show you exactly where it's pulling the information from.
Wendy, while that's running, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, uh, is there any way of locking these groups so that no one else can edit them? You'd have to revoke the role. But oh, then even really? then, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to access this area. Uh, okay. I don't think you can lock this portion down unless you just remove the full functionality. I've... Hi, it's Candace. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Um, I think it's I think it's a good note though that um, you have you have these sets um, in separate folders, right? There's the regular folder, which if you opened up groups in any clinic right now, you'd have some that came with the system. And those, those are ones you can play around with and change. And then maybe we could make a really strong point to the physicians and staff that the, this set is under a specific folder and these ones just don't change them. Go ahead and change the ones that you have that are, you know, came out of the box with the system. But um, they are in separate folders. We just maybe yeah. should point that out. Yeah, that's good. I've got a huge do not edit. <laughs> remark on mine, but, but um, yeah, I just thought it would be helpful if we could lock it. That's a good point, um, Tamara, when you say you have a, a do not edit, like, can you, is there a way to actually rename the folder or something, or are you just, ta you're just coaching the clinic on that? Um, you can name it, and, and I have, like, the, the folder heading as where, where Andy has EMR panel, um, I've got um, use use for background reporting. Do not edit in capital letters, and then each one is um, individually named because they're they're built. The unions and intersections pull from it too. So if it gets changed, then yeah, exactly. Do not modify. Awesome. Because mm. it'll cool. throw everything <laughs> off if someone goes in and, <laughs> and changes it. Yeah, Andy, maybe we should think about. Um putting something more prescriptive around the wording in there. Okay. So it just got disconnected. I have to rerun the group. Okay, uh, so this group has finished running. Um, what we'll do is we'll select someone from random. And what we'll do is I'll open up their clinical details. <clears throat> okay, so if I navigate over in usual prescriptions, Uh, right here, what we can do is we can just um, make everything in order. Okay. So right now I can see that he's on eight usual medications, so he falls under this category for five medications or more under the usual medications list.
Thanks, Andy. Well, are there any specific groups that you guys want to see run um, instead of me going through all of them? Yeah, good point. I'm, I'll leave that up to the group. Um, as you guys can see, that it, it takes you know it can take about a minute or so to run each of these. So, um, Andy, is I'm just wondering, hmm, would you guys like to look at the parameters around each of the around each of these queries? Do you want to to talk through that and understand, mm -hmm. or are there ones that you just would really like to see Andy pull? I just it would be, we would be here a while if we went through every single. One. Um, I just want to mention that uh, all of the parameters that are in the searches are the same codes as in the patient panel management tool. So those we reviewed them with Bruce mm -hmm. and Gang. So yeah, they're, they're the same codes that are in the tool. Yeah, and the user guide that will be circulating also has the the definitions. Well, this is Jennifer. I have a question. Um, in the macro, are they only looking for active patients they've seen within the past three years? Or all their active patients? It's looking for all their active patients. Um, it wasn't, I don't see anything in the specs where it says uh, within the last three years other than for the active patients report, which is this one right here. This is the only uh, report that actually uses a stored query. And um, under the specifications, it's looking for, <clears throat> it's looking for um, patients that have been seen in the last three years and their status is equal to active. But given that um, any of the other reports that you you run in this uh, query, you'll see for a date last contact, um, it will display when they were last seen. Jennifer, what, oh, I'm just curious, sorry if I just want to pry a little bit into, into that. So just, what are you thinking about in terms of um, like physicians' reactions to that? Like oh, understanding yeah. that understanding that they won't necessarily have been keeping the active status up to date. Um, yeah, I'm where I'm coming from. Is I I went and have done a few of these just manually, like just creating my uh, own dynamic group, and I just. I filtered it by three years because some of the active patients were like, you know, like 20,000 active patients and that, I mean, that's not really, really their active patients. So, I just, yeah. so the denominator for the panel assessment tool there, I just used active patients within the three year range is what we, to, to calculate those percentages. Yeah. I just yeah. thought I that mean, was perhaps more helpful than then uh, especially when you do have, when you do come across a problem yeah. where yeah, every single patient, every walk-in patient is an active patient or whatever. So, yeah. Um, I just have yeah. one more question just about the macro. When it's looking, is it just looking in the problem list or is it looking in other places as well to pull that uh, code from? Um, everything under this list minus the patients on five, or 10 or more medications. Uh, that's an unusual medications list. The rest is under the problem list. Okay, so just the, it's just pulling it from the problem list. Is there um, the future plans to pull um, patients that haven't had any coding done, like that? where the physician, like I'll give you an example. We had a physician that just retired. He had a practice, a panel size of 3,000 patients and he was old school. He had 27 chronic disease patients coded out of that 3,000. So now the, 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 the chore now for, for the other practices is to identify um, 
patients and co start coding them as they come in. Um, and it would be super helpful to kind of go through encounter notes or, or even the billing, like trying to identify, say, the, like the diabetics or, or hypertensive patients. Um, is, there, is there future plans to create those kind of sub reports to, to pull that information? Nurse Candace, I had the, a, a pretty similar situation, and what we did is we we ran a group, but we ran them searching patients using the code 250 or 401, et cetera, in the billing. So we could say who's ever been seen for diabetes, and then we could go through that list in the undock area and add the problem to the problem summary where where the physician feels it's applicable. So we started we started with using um, billing information if that makes sense. Right, it sure does. And, and I've, I've done the same thing. I've also pulled, I've created dynamic groups um, pulling a diabetes from the, the encounter description or, or the problem description too. But I'm wondering um, for the benefit of other, everybody else, um, will there be instructions about that? Um, it's definitely here. Um, Andy just actually quickly did this up there. I, I'm going to get him to edit it, open that up again, the one that you just created. So um, in profile, you can actually put in the encounter diabetes. You can put 250. You can do all of those sorts of things. So if you notice, you can go in, create your own group. So you don't have, so you can actually search to see if it's in an invoice, if it's in an encounter but that's not part of what they were asking us to do. So if you want to search for plate outliers, that's the best way to do it. And it will actually be a little bit faster than if you rely on us writing you macros on the back end, because the macros are really intensive. And you can run this group anytime. And a lot of these people have this set up under, or they should have them set up, um, under um, groups or FOQs existing from the pedo days. Okay. Because right down here where this drop down is, it's in problem list, in encounters or in invoices. So when you're in an encounter, you can just, you don't have to add it to the problem list. You can put the diagnostic code in and it won't necessarily be a problem. It's the only problem if you, add, if you right click and add it to the problem list. Yeah. So this, Thank would you. Make, this would make this a very, if we had all of those variables, it would make it a hugely intensive um, um, macro to write, and you'd probably bomb out a, a good chunk of people such as Hilltop. Uh, some of these people's databases are um, 300 to 500 gigabytes of data. They're absolutely massive databases. and. You would, it would just run forever and ever and ever. So you've got to make these small enough that they are actually, someone could actually use them at five o'clock or ten o'clock in the morning as opposed to trying every different variable out there. And then when you go to get the result, it's not necessarily, the result doesn't actually show you which one, where that is. So now if you have to go search for it, then you've got to go back and figure out, well, where did I find this 250, rather than making something that's very specific like this. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It sure does, Stephanie. I appreciate okay. that. Um, okay, so that's, guess, why, that's why it's done this way. Right, right. So I guess what I was kind of concerned about is um, is kind of coaching the, the, the offices. You know, if they, if, if they don't have their patients coded, like they ha say they have 200 diabetics, but only 20 are coded, how can we coach them to identify those other ones? And so I know that this is how we do it. Like I get, I, I know exactly how to do it. I'm just wondering, because this is part of the panel management tool, is it appropriate for for some in, like some instruction on if, on it at all? Like. A brief instruction, not not necessarily macro coding, but but exactly what you've done. You can also search 
diabetes and encounters and have maybe an alert saying or no, a warning saying this is very, very labor intensive. It takes time. Do not do this during office hours. But at least that's a way of coaching the offices to find their diabetics that haven't been coded. Okay, so that part is in the document, how to actually create your, these individually and make them how you want them to do it. But this is a standard set piece of functionality within Profile. So what Andy's been able to do is use standard functionality. Uh, we have not written anything extracurricular to this functionality for this piece. If that was to happen, it would be uh, a much longer delay and we'd have to do a, a lot more and I probably wouldn't have gotten approval to do it. So this is just using out of the, out of the you know, configurable out of the box software the way it actually comes from Profile. So it is in the document how to find the, the, the outliers because I understand what you're looking for. Once you find those outliers, if you undock that patient group, then you could add them all to your problem list, right? So for example, if you wanted to know everybody with metformin that uh, was coded, um, that wasn't coded with diabetes, you can then run that, see all the people that you've given a script for for metformin that should be diabetes and code them that way just using the undock feature within groups. So, um, it's Kelsey, maybe I could just add a little bit to this, and I, I think this is the piece that I was trying to um, sort of articulate at the beginning. Oh, what, yes, we haven't been able to fully address and predict what we will uncover, and every practice is so unique, and what, I know this situation you just described, Tamara, is a, a really good example. Um, un, undoubtedly, people, th this report will uncover people that have not been um, entering information into a way that then will appear on the report, and that's problematic in itself because what do you do when you know you've got, you know, way more diabetics that your report is saying you have none or virtually none? Um, and so I think for us in terms of where we're at with the pilot and learning, um, to be totally honest, you know, one of the conversations with the leads around who of you would be involved in this was based on your familiarity with interhealth and your um, experience, um, you know, coaching practices using interhealth. So that's one thing. I'm definitely very acutely aware of what would that look like for folks that haven't been, you know, um, working in interhealth at all. So, um, you know, I think that in terms of what we're going to learn together and be able to add in, in terms of this report remains very much on the table for discussion. I, I don't know if we build more um, common queries to this, so if this then what, or if we more just do um, training for you folks and, and your peers that will be supporting this work, I'm, I'm open to all those suggestions. But ultimately, yes, we know there's a gap in, in what is the functionality that, that this is right now and what it will uncover and getting the practice to that end goal of the, you know, improving the data. So I think it's a little bit of a balance of both. And in my mind, what I'm thinking in our, about, you know, what does this look like in terms of um, rolling it out more broadly around the province, province pardon me, um, it includes a lot of additional, I would say, supports, like things like, you, you know, kind of like revisiting that user group model, having strong peer support that can that can help share the workload because it's going to be a lot of work and every practice will be somewhat different, although I think we have the ability collectively to unveil some common themes, denominators, what would be a value, what you're seeing a lot of. Um, so it's, it's definitely a work in progress, but I, I, I just want to really emphasize that what this is today can evolve and we would need to work with Stephanie's team to figure out what that looks like. But yes, it can evolve. This is just a starting point from the pilot, as she said, you know, we wanted to get something out and um, and, and largely we don't know what we don't know. And, and, we're, and we're learning this in the other EMRs as well, just to be clear and, and fair. Um, this, this exercise uncovers information that is, is potentially problematic for us to deal with. So, um, it's a it's a tough spot to be in, but we 
we hope that we can, you know, all work together to start to figure out where we can make improvements for the practice, like looking at it from a sort of a physician or a practice centric perspective, how can we make this process as easy as possible for them? Does that make sense? I know it's not an answer and I, I feel bad because it's not really saying, yes, I'm going to make this better right now, but um, there's a whole bunch of things I think that we could do based on one-off scenarios, but I think what would be, what will be valuable at the end of the pilot is to see where are the clear, clear and common um, themes emerging or what is, is what is, um, you know, what is appearing over and over again that would be of value to add. You know, I, I, I think that's great, your comments, Kelsey and, and, and Stephanie and um, the rest of the team there. I, I, I think this is a fantastic start here. Um, and, you know, like it, it, it's, it still can be, these, these are tools that can, can help us with our coaching as well. Like, you know, if, they, if we run a diabetic report and there aren't as many diabetics as the physician thinks, then, then there's our discussion. Are you adding it to the problem list? You have to code things in order for us, it, for it to show up in report. So, you know, there, there, there are things that we can do with even just basic reports. So, so this, this is an excellent mm -hmm. start and, and I'm excited mm -hmm. that if, if, we get a little deeper. I, I like getting deeper, so but, but I realize yeah. that we have to start somewhere here. So this is good. It's good. Really good. Good. Yeah. Good word. We definitely need to go deeper, and we're aware of that. Um, I think that the deeper is is sort of yet to be determined, and a lot of that I would I would hope to would um, evolve and align with provincially kind of where we're going um, around conversations with the patient medical home and sort of provincial, I guess. I don't like to use the word target, but for lack of a better word, if there are certain population groups that are of high priority to GPSC or, and or the health authorities around supporting patient medical home, primary care home work, I'm thinking chronic pain, I'm thinking mental health, you know, those, those sort of at high risk populations, um, I think that can also help us with our work and where to start and how to broach conversa conversations and so forth. Hi, Stephanie, can I ask a question? Um, I just have a question about the goal of doing this. So is this more to identify patients who have all of these as those stated problems, like so that the physician knows that they're dealing with this, or is the goal of this to figure out where they haven't been optimizing their EMR? So they're not using it the way that we've all intended it to be used or thought that they would be using. So they still do their prescriptions by hand or they maybe type 250 in, but they don't, or maybe they just give them a prescription for metformin, but they don't really do anything else. Because from what I see, this is more of a, let's identify who you've got and so that we can, we can understand population groups within the, within the physician's private office versus what the data cleanup. Does yeah, okay, so let me try. Yeah, let me try to answer that. <laughs> I'll, I'll rewind back to what I, what I understand to be the original sort of impetus for this work um, from GPSC's perspective. So um, one of the things that's potentially on the table for um, negotiation and, and access um, for physician practices is something that the ministry has been sort of um, talking about as a potential, um, I guess, carrot for lack of a better word, um, would be the potential for access um, some hours per week to a nurse in practice. Um, so it's kind of taking that whole notion of team-based care a step further by actually having um, a, an additional resource potentially at the practice. Um, so that, of course, basically fast forwards us into the world of team-based care and potentially, and um, in preparation for that, you know, they started thinking about, okay, well, in order to think about how you might leverage this additional resource, um, let's rewind a step and, and make sure that we understand, you understand really what's going on in your practice. So yes, it's about just the, sh the sheer sort of the numbers around it, how many active patients you really have, and from there, let's look at some of the, um, you know, the, the actual, the metrics around, um, 
you know, the, some of the chronic disease patients and so forth, those are in line with the, the sort of the high risk patient populations identified in, in primary, sorry, patient medical home um, models. So these would be the types of patients we'd be looking at around, um, you know, potentially leveraging a nursing practice. So it's a little bit of both. And then Stephanie, I think um, the other thing, I, I think the gap, and I, I just sent you a document, um, you and, and um, Andy document more around the PSP processes around this, what we've asked them, because of course this uncovers so much information and we know that it's not realistic for them to address everything um, with the sort of the time frame and the compensation that we've offered. So what we've asked them to do is hone in on I think three to five as part of what we're calling an action plan to do this work. So that gives the practice a little bit of autonomy in saying, well, here's what's most relevant to me or what I believe is most relevant to me in terms of my, my patients and my practice. Does that help? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Okay. I just wanted to share um, something that I've uh, been working with some physicians lately and I thought it was really interesting that um, this kind of time frame of active patients, three years, five years, whatever the physician thinks should be a, an appropriate date range, but when we were doing some data cleanup, um, one of the physicians in our project that we're working on she actually did a search for all patients who have not been in in over five years to review the list. And there was a patient in particular, she thought it was really strange that they hadn't come in considering their conditions and they phoned the patient and it turns out it was a good thing because he had bladder cancer and prostate cancer and he's now been through surgery and, and taken care of. But it, it was a total aha moment where we can easily take all the old patients and go through them and just change them to inactive or, or what have you, but uh, maybe have the doctor take a look at the names before you do those kinds of changes. But it was also a good opportunity for them to call some patients and say, are you still considering yourself a patient of our practice or have you gone elsewhere? And if so, that's fine, we can transfer your chart. But um, they used this data cleanup um, for some touch points with the patients, which I thought was just really astounding. And it is certainly not every physician's gonna do that, but it, it was a nice point. The other thing that we saw through this project is that um, if you do limit uh, your time period, you will always have names that show up that have been moved, deceased, uh, inactive, until you get them off your list. And so if you're looking for all your diabetic patients, uh, you're searching by 250 on the problem summary, but that, you know, Ann Smith is going to show up every time, even though she's been gone for seven years. Um, and the only way to get her off of the list is to change the status. So while I, I think it's a good indicator of how many active patients you have to look at a certain time frame, we're also wanting to consider data accuracy and not having these names show up all the time everywhere if they truly are inactive. And so it is. I, we thought that it was quite valuable to look at the entire active list as it is, even even if it's completely messy and, and the number's outrageous, which it is in a lot of cases. It's not feasible that the physician's gonna go through all 8,500 patients, but at least get them off of your registries um, and then you won't see the names repeatedly. So I'd share some outcomes of a project we were working on. Yeah, definitely. And this is where it this is where every situation is different, right? Depending on what approach or what the the, the practice is sort of willing to do or um, around, like you said, those touch points. Um, and so this is where each each practice's sort of action plan is really their own their own decision and their own commitment under under the physician's purview, right? How how thorough do they want to be? Um, all we can do is, is sit back and, and coach them on, on pieces, but ultimately um, how they will approach this work is, is very much to their own discretion. Can I make another comment here at Tamara? I, um, I really have loved using this EMR. Like I've, I've, I've absolutely felt like it's a Lamborghini of EMRs and being able to show physicians what it can do for them and how it can help them and and just to have very robust data very accurate data is is very exciting and it, you know they they invest in this they trust it and and in showing them how it can work for them is so phenomenal so 
I, I just wanted to say that. I, I, I think that. Oh, I second that. <laughs> um, the, I, Stephanie, again, I just wanted to, to also let you um, guys think about something also. Um, uh, I would say probably 99% of every client that IntraHealth has on profile in British Columbia had some sort of data transfer whether it was just a plain MSBA file that brought in just a ton of patient demographics from um, billing systems that were really, really old. I used to work at Smart Series, so like there was no clinical data, it was just everybody. And so you will encounter a lot of that sort of um, active patient because there's nothing, as the person here who does oversees a lot of the data transfers, um, we can't get people to clean up their data in their old database before we import it. We have to take everything and make sure that we, we give them everything. So you could potentially, in a lot of places, see a lot of patients that nobody had, they don't have any data whatsoever. They're just active patients sitting there from data transfers that were done years and years ago. And there's nothing that you can do about it other than take a look at who those patients are and deactivate them. I think that's a good point, Stephanie. When you when you run a list of your active patient panel and you see the date of last contact column is blank and the physician's been on the EMR for five years, those are the easiest ones to go to, to look and see, you know, just make sure they haven't been in, make sure there's nothing that they need to keep the record, you know, active for and inactivate them. That, that date of last contact is a really handy column. Um, actually, we can actually show you somewhere else, too, where if you don't see it after we run this, it's actually in Alter Patient. Okay. We'll just wait for it to open up. We need to run a thing on this database. And it, what's it under? Organization, I think. See up here um, where you've got data loss contact, date first seen. Okay, so in a lot of data transfer situations, you'll find two things. You'll find a consistent date. So you'll have 5,000 patients with the same date. Well, you know that's a data transfer um, because it's how it comes in. It starts to get updated as the current patients get used, but anybody I did a data transfer four or five years ago and you haven't seen that patient, you'll notice that date, date last contact, date first seen will have some pretty funky dates in them or nothing at all. Depending That's handy. On the, uh, depending on the data transfer type that I did. Hi, um, this is Merlin. While I have all the experience here of the group running them, um, I've only attempted this on a single clinic so far, and the first time I, I think it was maybe the diabetes or hypertension one, it like hit an hour of it was going to run. What's been the other people's experience? Like, are you actually working after hours to run these, or are you using find objects instead? I just, or I know, Stephanie, is this possible that we can schedule some of these to run in the evening, or what's the potential? Or is it just a um, weird clinic? <laughs> um, you might have had just a weird clinic, but because these are macros, um, depends on who the clinic is too. If it's one of the larger clinics on Vancouver Island and it's trying to sort through this mess, because these are all starts with, they're not looking for exact, they're not a single query saying look for, you know, 493 and 494. They're saying start with this and look at every sort of subsection of that diagnostic code to make sure it shows up. So it's, right. if it's a large clinic, it's, yeah, it's gonna run, it's gonna take a long time to do it. And the KPI, these aren't KPIs, these are groups, so there's no way to schedule these. KPIs you could schedule, but not these. Okay, no, it's good to know. Maybe I'll go and look at potentially editing my own copy to see if I can make it run faster. Yeah, it might be, there might be something else too that uh, there could be something else in it. All of our ones on our data center are regular, are the, data, the databases are regularly optimized. It's part of um, our scheduled maintenance that we do for the customer. So right. it, 
it, it is done um, because they have, and they're on SQL 2012. Um, but um, so it is, it is as fast and as best as we can actually make it. It's just like I said, if you've got a huge clinic, yeah. And uh, one, no, I think uh, some of the North Shore would have been bigger than the clinic I was working with. So, and, and I've done find object stuff with um, the active patients, and it was really fast to execute. And I know their active patients are realistic. Um, so uh, maybe I'll speak with you, or I'll work more closely with Andy to see what's going on, maybe. Yeah, it could be something really weird with that single clinic, but if it's a small clinic, it shouldn't be a problem. But the first thing I would do would be find out who the clinic was and look at the size of the database. Yeah, I know their database is huge because they scan a lot. Oh, there That's you okay, go. thanks. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I know who the doctor is now, too. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you don't know who the doctor is. No, you're thinking oh. of someone else. Oh, I'm thinking of somebody else that likes to scan everything? Okay. Yeah, no, this is this is rightful scanning. <laughs> Stephanie, did, is it does it take up more power to run a macro rather than a stored query? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. A, store, a stored query is a, thing, a simple SQL script, single line script. This is um, a lot of do this, then do this, and then do this. So basically do something, then run something else to refine it, then run something else to refine that. So it would be like if you ran a group on top of a group, on top of a group, on top of a group. Yeah, it takes a lot more processing power. Now, it could be that depending on who it is, it also could be too if you've got someone else in the clinic at a particular time, let's say processing billing or doing something else in the clinic at the same time, these guys all have IH most of them have more than one profile server that's not a box, it's actually the application server that runs. So that's all balance, load balanced. So if you've got like, you know, 10 people logged in, it's balancing a load to get every single one of those users, regardless of who they are, depending on what they're doing, and it's trying to balance it out. And then you, you log in and you run a query, you, like, it, it could just become really intensive depending on what everybody else is doing. But without knowing who it is and when it happened and doing a little bit of investigative work, there's no way to give you a definitive answer because there's too many, um, too many variables. Okay. Um. Just a, a way to skip some of the longer ones or using a macro for certain ones is um, asking, asking the doctor what they code. And so uh, as an example, if a, a doctor uses 250.1, 250.2, they use all the 250 reference, then run the macro. But if they are really good at using just 250, then run it in a regular group and it takes seconds. And so um, learning how the doctor codes, I think, is, is a good a good tip because some of these ones you can just run the number straight up and not start with. Uh, whereas if they're like, geez, I don't know, I think I probably use all sorts of variations of that, then then maybe do the macro. Candace, I think that's great advice because yeah, this, this clinic is pretty tight on their coding, so I think that's what I need to look at. Thanks. Hi, it's, uh, it's Jennifer. I just had a couple questions. Um, once you've run one of the macros and you get your list on the bottom of the screen, can you sort it by provider by just clicking on provider? Sorry, I'm really new to profile, so. Yeah. Okay, so that's how I would sort it into, okay. Yeah, I've also stated in the manual where it shows you how to create um, your filters, so right here. Right now we're looking at for all the providers. So a patient provider is set to any. And if you ever wanted to sort it, you just click on the header and it would sort it all for you. If you want to pinpoint it to one specific provider, um, here you'll just change the patient provider is and then change it from any to is and then enter in that provider's account. Um, Andy, where did, where did you pull that up from? I didn't see where your mouse went. Uh, I hit edit right here. Oh, okay, in the corner there. Awesome. It's stated in the manual too. Okay, great. Um, I and my other question is probably more for Kelsey. Um, I had uh, sent in the clinic contact to get this um, 
reporting features activated or have that has that happened yet or is that still in in holding good question um yeah so we held it so um because we decided to make a few um a tweak um, based on, you know, some, some of the great feedback that we had from the group initially, we held it and now um, it's, it's in sequence with some other um, larger sort of technical updates, sorry, I'm probably not using the right language, Stephanie, um, but some other larger or, or broader um, rollouts that are ha that's happening for Interhealth. So although Andy has made the changes, I don't believe it will be available until um, I think the last I heard was next Thursday. So we do apologize for the delay. We've been, we have all of the information and they will all be activated in, in mass. Um, and I will send you an email, Andy and or I will send you an email um, confirming when it's on. But Andy, we, we only spoke yesterday, so I'm not sure if there's any um, more definitive news, but are you still thinking, um, aiming for like next Thursday? Yeah, uh, I have to put in the request though. I'm uh, just waiting for resources okay. right now. Um, so yeah. I'll help you as soon as I get that information. Okay. Do you want to um, speak a little bit about, because I know that you guys have a, a larger um, sort of upgrade going on in, in, in the background of all this happening. So it's being, um, it's sort of coinciding with some of that. Is that right? Uh, What's the yeah, language? I'm sorry. I know it's an, is it, is it, is it a version upgrade? Yeah, in version 8, everything will be included in there. Okay, okay. So, um, so when we're messaging it to practices, is it um, that needs to be consistent, so it will be included in the version 8, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so sorry, Jennifer, we don't have a, a, an answer, I guess, because Andy and <laughs> And Stephanie are relying somewhat on their deployment team, so they have to just verify when. And so there's a lot of other beta testing that's going on in the background that this needs to fit into. Um, but we will make sure that you are notified um, when it's um, when it's live. Actually, Andy, are we able to notify them earlier? Like, are we able to send the RSTs an email even a few business days ahead to say this is the day it will be deployed? Because I know a lot of you guys are. Um, are basing that on making appointments at practices and so forth. Uh, like, like Andy, if you find out, for example, that it's going to be Thursday, could we just email them when we know what the date will be? Uh, yeah, as, generally, as the, as you know. generally when I create a request, um, mm -hmm. there in the note in the ticket, there will be a date set on okay. when they'll be recording it, and they'll get a notification for that. But that's only for the okay. clinic, it won't be for the RST because they're not a contact of that clinic. Um, but we talked about we talked about emailing the RSTs that are on the sign up list just to let them know. I, I can do that manually on my okay. end. But you guys don't okay. have a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, you guys will know. I'm sorry there's not a lot of lead time because I know that you're needing to make appointments at practices, but we also just really wanted to make sure we got these fixes in before you, you were out there. Um, I have a couple follow-up questions to that then. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if you might not be able to answer this, but I mean, I'm under the impression, and maybe I could be quite possibly wrong, that we were supposed to kind of wrap up this testing phase by the end of March. Um, so I'm just a bit concerned about trying to um, get the ones who are interested in testing this and getting them to make improvements for the second time we run it, because you know, that's what they're kind of, the payments all kind of hinged on, whether they make improvements to their, to their panel. Yeah, we, yeah, you know, very so good point and good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm no, wondering about good question. Kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that. Yep. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that we've sent out some clear communication about cutoff dates, but what we've discussed, with Aaliyah and, and I have discussed, is that now, um, just given that this has been delayed, um, and yes, it will be like a mad dash to do the work and we don't want the, the practices to feel, you know, super swamped. It's more now looking like you must start. You must have initiated this process by March 31st. And I'm thinking that we're going to give them about a four week timeline then to cut off. So probably towards the end of April, um, just to give you a little bit more flex time in terms of having that funding and closing that loop. So um, Ali and I were actually just talking about that this morning. So we'll make sure we get some, um, some subsequent messaging out to you on that. But yes, you have some breathing room. Okay, and of course, I'm sorry, I have another question. Um, 
originally I had sent in to Aaron, you know, like let's activate these couple clinics and um, since the timing kind of got delayed, I just went ahead and did it manually. Should we still just leave them in the queue or should I pull them out? Because I've already gone in and started the work just doing doing it manually without the without all this. Is your intention that they'll use the automated report to kind of then reassess where they're at? Is that your, I'm your not intention? Sure. I've, got, I've got enough uh, clinics interested in this that I don't have to do that. I mean, I could, but uh, I'm just, just curious because I know within each health authority, you're only allowed a certain amount of licenses during this type of testing phase or this, um, so yeah, I don't want to so hold them all. <laughs> The way that the the funding model has been set up is more to use the, I mean, I don't know how you're working with them or what arrangements you've made with the MOA, for example, but yeah. really the, 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 the payment or the remuneration reflects, I think, um, you know, more appropriately reflects, reflects using a, a CAN report. I'm, I, maybe you're very efficient at, at doing this, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, oh no, I, I highly doubt that. But, uh, okay, so <laughs> I just I would be a little con I would be a little concerned that probably the compensation for I guess whomever time is sitting with you and, and running these reports on more of a, a manual basis that, that might not be accurately reflected in what we've put forward for the pilot. Um, so maybe can we Jennifer connect offline? I don't want to I don't want to say yes or no because I don't want to hold you up, especially if you've got good momentum with the practices and they're willing to to do this piece this way, um, but okay. that then they don't necessarily need to take spots off of the pilot as well, because really the pilot is for using the, the canned reports um, in terms of the way we've um, set up the compensation and the amount of hours. So can we connect offline? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's Okay, fine. cool. Thanks. So I'm just, I'm just aware we're at five minutes after two. We technically only have about 25 minutes left. Um, we, we sort of di well we diverged, but in a very good way. Um, I think we had a lot of we covered a lot of good good stuff there. Um, does anyone though just acknowledging we only have about 20 minutes left? Does anyone want to specifically look at any of the um, the queries here on the panel report that Andy hasn't already shown? No. Okay. Um, is there any other general questions or anything, Andy, that you would like to cover before we before we wrap up? I don't have anything else. You don't? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, then maybe I'll suggest that we think about wrapping up. Um, and yeah, so I think that the, the, the next or the follow-up thing is to send you guys out the user manual. Actually, Tamara and Ken, I've just um, sort of um, asked, <laughs> sort of vol volunteered Candace and Tamara and the others who have been working with us to review it. Hopefully, they have the chance. Um, but it's a document that can be living. So if you guys, once you get it and you see it, if you can think of anything that you think would be helpful or if there's something that's maybe not really resonating with you or isn't entirely clear language, please let us know because it's, you know, absolutely needs to be useful for you. So if you're not understanding something, um, I can only imagine that it might be even that much more difficult for your practice to be understanding. So please do not hesitate to give us feedback on the user guide. Um, we'll have that to you hopefully by end of week. And I will be sure to email out this recording. And we will also be emailing you when we have a confirmed go live date for the report. Is there anything, Andy, that I haven't covered, do you think, in terms of sort of the next couple of steps? Um, no, but I was wondering if you can just stay on the line after. I uh, just wanted mm -hmm. to ask some stuff. Yeah, yeah for sure. Any any last minute questions? I didn't want to. Sorry, we had some good conversation, but then I got worried if, in case if someone wanted to talk about kind of go back to the panel stuff. Um, if you have any other questions, you, you can ask them right now. Okay. All right. We'll take that as not no, not for now. Um, thank you guys very much for your time, and I look forward to many more um, opportunities to talk with you about this report, how it's working, how we can improve the process for you and the physicians. Um, 
So yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you guys. And Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. I'll Thanks, follow everyone. up with you, Jennifer. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, it, I just wanted to say I'll follow up with you, Jennifer, about your question. Okay, I'll okay. make sure to follow up with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.